Thank you for the honor of speaking here today. I'm really excited. My name is Candice, and I work in the rapidly evolving world of marketing communication. As a child of the 80s, I have seen and embraced the rise and rise of communication technologies. From my GeoCities webpage, my chunky mobile phone, and my MySpace profile, to using my iPhone to catch up on my tweets, I have been an avid adopter. <laughs> but witnessing these incredible advances has forged a lifelong passion in trying to understand how these tools affect us beyond their primary purposes. Today, I would like to kind of examine the impact of communication technologies in our lives and how it's changed the way we think and the way we interact with each other. And Interestingly, you know, we all know the advances that these things have brought to our lives. We embrace them. They're part of us. However, we don't often think if there are any side effects to being plugged in. So in this session, I would like to talk about that and let you kind of come up with the ideas for yourself. Think back just 10 years ago. The world was a totally different place. The term social media didn't yet exist. Google was not yet a recognized verb. People still watched America's Funniest Home Videos. <laughs> and only birds tweeted. Quick audience poll. Who here is on Facebook? Who here has watched a YouTube video of a laughing baby? <laughs> Who sent out a tweet in the last few hours? I know I did. And that's what I said. Seriously, though. Communication has become entrenched, uh, communication technologies have become entrenched in every aspect of our daily lives. Facebook's meteoric rise is astounding. So much so that if there were a United States of Facebook, it would be the third most populated country in the world after China and India. As of 2011, there are two, uh, 550 million active Facebook users. That's one in every 13 people on Earth interacting in a borderless, interconnected world. So we may not often stop to think about it, but the shifts that these communication technologies have brought about have profoundly changed the way we live, the way we communicate and interact. We tend to reflect on the positives, how it's connected us, forged a global community, kick-started an age where information is accessible and power is decentralized. But there is a case for how it's changed us. So let's explore some key examples. Social change. Never before has a generation been able to, in a position to enable a grassroots political action. Yes, while revolutions may have existed before this new age of connectivity, you know, never before has the power of real-time network communication been able to kickstart that and accelerate that. And that's something that's really visible in our age and very active right now as we speak. So if communication can connect us in ways influential enough to challenge political regimes, what other influences does it have in our lives? The March 11th earthquake and tsunami is an emotive example of how the world banded together through technology and social media. Outpourings of support warnings and advice for those people still affected, as well as raw footage of the quake and its tragic after effects were immediately accessible. I'm not sure if any of you guys followed it on the day, but it was incredible that something that normally would be available to us through the delayed perspective of telev television news was something that we could immediately react to. We have some staggering amount of information that we were able to see and for example, the amount of Twitter tweets and Twitter accounts that were opened as a result of this was just enough to show us how influential Twitter is in our lives. And I think all in all, by witnessing firsthand the plight of those people affected, people could relate to the catastrophe in ways never before imagined. Journalist Kayla Colbin eloquently stated, no human can fail to be moved by the horrific tragedy of Japan made so real by user-generated content coming from that ravaged coastline and its very lack of professionalism, making it so abundantly clear 
that there is no difference at all between us and them. More than just forging a global community, the proliferation of technology and social media offers a forum for expression, a platform for discovery, and a channel to share common interests beyond geographic, age, and cultural limitations. So, the question to ask right now is, are we more in touch with people than ever before? I recently have a great example of a cartoon. As much as these technologies have connected us, researchers like British psychologist Dr. Eric Sigmund are observing that people are becoming more and more physically and socially disengaged from each other. Are we building personal fortresses surrounded by digital moats and digital walls? Wearing earphones or regularly talking, talking texting, and emailing may, may seem innocent enough, but Dr. Sigmund believes that these disconnections are causing us to step away from each other or step back from one another in unprecedented magnitude. I recently went to a social media conference looking to connect with others. I guess that's what the aim of social media is all about. But when I arrived, all I saw was people face down, thumbs flying over their keyboards and smartphones. For me, this scenario epitomized a shift in our value structure. Has the surge in connectivity caused us to value online communications on par with real life face-to-face -face interactions? An extreme example of the blurring between our virtual and traditional lives is the story of Rick Hochstraft. In 2007, the Wall Street Journal reported how Rick had married Janet Spielman. Curiously, Rick was already married. And no, this is not a typical tale of polygamy. Fortunately for him, the second wedding ring was much cheaper. Rick had decided to take the plunge virtually to a woman he had never met or even spoken to over the phone. Despite their lack of traditional communication, they had, their relationship had taken on curiously real dimensions. They owned two dogs, paid a mortgage, and spent up to 16 hours a night and 14 hours at a stretch on a weekend together in Second Life. Rick's real flesh and blood wife, poor neglected lady, she was originally unaware of the relationship, but eventually attended gaming widow support groups. <laughs> She told the Wall Street Journal, basically, no, the other person is widowed. The other life is so wonderful, so much better than real life. Nobody gets fat, nobody gets gray. It's hard to compete with that. Living another life in second life raises an interesting question. Can we equate virtual relationships to have the same value as traditional ones? If so, is Rick's virtual marriage considered adultery? Experts like Brian Reeves, a professor of communication at Stanford University, has found that feelings that people have online are in fact real emotions. Connections with other characters, such as loss, friendship, and even love, are real, and that humans do not have the ability to draw a distinction between how we feel on and offline. If we can attribute real emotions to virtual environments, then we must value our online lives very highly. So much so that millions of people are prepared to spend not only real time, but real currency in social games. Combining both the allure of gaming and social networking, the social, game, social gaming movement is exploding. In fact, market research firm Parks Associates has valued the global market for social gaming to be in excess of $5 billion in 2015. Farmville, the most popular social game on Facebook, has cultivated more than 80 million users. While the game can be played for free, players get an edge by paying anything from $1 to $50 in exchange for farm cash and farm coins. The average user plays for approximately 33 minutes a day, but Farmville is notoriously addictive. For those of you who have already fallen prey to the Farmville addiction, here is a five-step process for recovery. <laughs> so, if we're addicted to stuff like Farmville, what other dependencies have arisen from our kind of connection to communication technologies? 
The great power of communication technology lies in its ability to make information that is of inherent interest to us immediately accessible. We constantly have access to our social connections, our work, news, and pretty much any information you can Google in order to settle a debate. What's quite interesting is that our brains feed off the constant buzzes that our phones give us to alert us when we need to give them attention, and our brains are actually feeding on that. Um, when, we, when our brains, our brains release the, the neurotransmitted dopamine when we anticipate reward. And according to Dr. Gary Small, neurologist and co-author of iBrain, the um, surviving the technical alteration of the modern mind, there is very little difference to how our dopamine reward systems react to different stimuli, such as food, sex, drugs, and receiving a text message. We've become addicted to that new, exciting bit of information, not just because we want to stay in the loop, but because our brains find this very seductive. This reinforcement leads to more usage and more reliance, which in itself has a very interesting impact. Our collection of Go Everywhere gadgets and services exists specifically for, to remember things that we don't need to. For example, our cell phones can store hundreds of numbers in our database, in our in its memory. So why do we need to cram that in our own memories? What we find, almost without noticing it, is that we're outsourcing important peripheral brain functions to the silicone around us. In fact, neurologists like Ian Robinson have found that young people are less able than their elders to recall standard personal information, such as relatives' birthdays and their own mobile numbers. All in all, our, our connection or our relationship with communication technology is actually rewiring our brains. Maggie Jackson, author of Distracted, The Erosion of Attention in the Coming Dark Age, cautions of the effects of our high-speed, overloaded, split-focused, and even cyber-centric society. She warns that a never-ending stream of phone calls, instant messages, text messages, and tweets is part of an institutionalized culture of interruption and it makes it hard to concentrate and think creatively. We now tend to multitask instead of focus, and this affects how our brains absorb information. In 2006, psychologist Russell Poldrack and his colleagues at UCLA showed that multitaskers and focused learners use different parts of their brain when studying the same thing. Multitaskers fire up their striatum, or what basically makes encodes memory as habit or procedural memory. Um, meanwhile, the people that were able to study without distraction, they relied on the hippocampus, a seahorse-shaped structure that basically is at the heart of our declarative memory circuits. We use our hippocampus, for example, when trying to apply abstract rules to um, novel problems, say, for example, in math class. And so Poldrick's study eventually found that multitaskers have, they, they can't apply their learning in the same way that the focused learners could. And so essentially, while we can still learn while multitasking, it's the kind of learning that's easy to forget. Many would argue, and I'm sure all of us as we're texting and uh, watching TV and emailing, can say that multitasking is productive. However, Linda Stone sees a different side to the story. She coined the term continuous partial attention to describe how many of us use our attention today. And this is different to multitasking. Multitasking we use when we're not really, when we're doing something automatic, when it's something that requires little attention. To pay continuous partial attention is to pay partial attention continuously to things that should demand our full attention. And because this is so much a part of our daily lives, we find it hard to distance ourselves and switch it off. I went through an education where I had to find information through an encyclopedia um, by looking, by reading books and completing projects in paper. Modern communications developed as I did, and by my college years, they were part of my everyday life. Being on the cusp of Generation Google and Generation Ancient, I have fully adopted communication technology, yet I'm aware of a time before their proliferation. Seeing the influence of these technologies on our minds, an interesting question arises is whether digital immigrants who know nothing other than complete technical integration think differently to digital natives. How they think is affected by how much they actually consume 
And the Kaiser Family Foundation found that these kids pack a total of 10 hours and 45 minutes into a typical day of media. That's two and a quarter hours more than five years ago. So now kids are growing up in an age where constant, uh, surrounded by constant stimulation and instant gratification, where immediacy and efficiency is above all else. And this is having an effect on how you, they learn. Why need to focus when everything is in Google? Why need to study when the first answer in Wikipedia is sufficient? Furthermore, the heavy use of technology stops, the additional, stops their ability to have brain downtime, the ability to synthesize information. And, have, and because kids have more trouble setting priorities than adults, they just can't avoid the constant ping of status updates and text messages. The last few years have seen such fundamental and rapid changes. So what does the future have in store for us? Susan Greenfield, a professor of pharmacology at Oxford University, has a very interesting perspective. Real conversation in real time may give way to desanitized and on-screen dialogues in much the same way as killing, skinning, and butchering meat to eat has been replaced by the conveniences of packages on supermarket shelves. She thinks that perhaps future generations will recoil with a similar horror at the messiness, unpredictability, and immediate personal involvement of three-dimensional real-time interaction. This may be a bit extreme, but I do worry that communication technology has become a mediator between human and social interactions, perhaps to the point where it dehumanizes the process. Our texting habits, for example, have actually led us to avoid face-to-face -face contact. Studies from Pew Research show that we default to text when we find it hard to relay information. And we stare at our phones when we want to avoid eye contact. Case in point, is this becoming a tool for entertainment, distraction, and avoidance, or actually the beginning of face-to-face, -face, the beginning of displacement of face-to-face -face communication? Like the phone, the radio, and TV, all new technologies have been argued to have negative effects on our quality of life and the current way of life. The great philosopher Socrates bemoaned the development of writing. He thought that if we begin to rely on um, the written word, we'll cease to forget, we'll cease to use our memories, and we'll have the conceit of wisdom instead of real wisdom. He couldn't foresee the many ways in which the written word had changed society brought about new ideas, kick-started an age of the expanded human knowledge. So while skeptics may fear the rise of technology to herald the end of intimate human relationships and deep thinking, we should think, just like Socrates, that we are still in the early stages of development of this technology and don't know its full potential and where it will lead us. I think, given the emphasis on communication and sharing, this technology will naturally be directed towards building a world where we are increasingly more connected with each other. Perhaps a world where our resident cyborg will be able to teach us more things, and as well as connected with the collective of human knowledge, heralding a new age of endless possibilities. <laughs>